Good afternoon and good evening. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a wonderful panel for you today on President Zelensky's foreign policy one year into his administration. And we have distinguished speakers coming to you from California, from Washington, and from Kiev. We have Aljona uh, Gitmanchuk, the director of the New Europe Center in Kiev. And before that, she was the co-founder and director of the Institute for World Policy. We have Bogdan Nahailo, a distinguished analyst and uh, who had a career with Amnesty International, Radio Liberty, and the UN High Commission for Refugees, and the author of two books on Soviet disunion and the Ukrainian resurgence. We have Steve Pfeiffer, a former ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, still active at the Brookings Institute, even though he's out on the West Coast at Stanford. And we have Andriy Abzaharanyuk, former Minister of Defense and a businessman. So I'd like to welcome all of our distinguished speakers and we can start the conversation. So my be to Aljona. Um, President Zelensky ran as someone who would maintain Ukraine's westward orientation, yet also ardently seek peace with Moscow. What is your bottom line assessment of his performance and are these two objectives compatible? Um, thank you, Ambassador Herbst, for your question and for having me to, today. Well, uh, taking stock of the first year of Zelensky presidency, I would say that probably the main thing is not what Zelensky has really done, but what he has not done. He has not challenged, for example, Ukraine's integration to uh, the European Union or, uh, and to NATO. He has not accepted Putin's terms on Donbass settlement, at least as for now. Even if he wanted to do something of that, he proved unable to neglect the reaction of the Ukrainian society and Ukrainian parliament, including his own political party, Sluha Narodu. And um, here we should not forget the simple fact, actually, that all Ukrainian revolutions, or Maidans, as we call them in Ukraine, were held in support for Ukraine in Europe idea. None of them was held in support of closer relations with Russia. That means that uh, no matter how strong the sentiments uh, towards peace with Russia are, they are unable, especially since the beginning of Russian aggression in uh, 2014, uh, to bring um, hundreds of thousands of people uh, Ukrainians on the streets in support of the idea of closer relations with Russia. While opponents of another rapprochement with Russia would be ready to go in the streets as soon as they feel that Zelensky is going to sell Ukraine to Putin. Um, yes, Zelensky foreign policy has been strongly subordinated to his electoral promise to end the war in Donbass. I agree with you. But uh, at this still rather initial stage of peace talks uh, with Moscow, it has not affected much Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic choice. Uh, I have no doubt that at more advanced level of negotiations with Putin, the issue of Ukraine's integration to the EU and especially to NATO will definitely pop up in quite predictable way. So if you ask me if these two aims to end the war in Donbass and to integrate with, uh, with the West are compatible, I would say rather no, at least while Putin is in Kremlin. Even now we see that um, Zelensky, we see Zelensky clear political leadership on Donbass issue, but we don't see his political leadership uh, on the EU and NATO. At least I don't see that. Um, also, we could say that Zelensky peace strategy, if we can call that peace strategy, significantly complicated Ukraine's positioning. Under President Poroshenko, everything was more or less clear. Ukraine was a victim of Russian aggression. Um, Ukraine needs assistance, support. Ukraine needs allies. The world was divided into two camps. The aggressor, which is Russia, and its mostly marginal associates and Ukraine as a victim of aggression and its mostly respectable allies. Now the picture is much more complicated. And what we have been witnessing also is a clear attempt um, of Ukrainian President Zelensky to refocus Ukraine's foreign policy from the search for allies to the search for investors. 
but um, as um, as a result, um, it looks like we have not secured neither new powerful allies nor new strategic investors, at least for now. Um, among Zelensky clear achievement, foreign policy achievement, uh, I personally would name the improvement of Ukraine's relationship with our Western neighbors, especially with uh, our strategic long-term partner, Poland. There is a good chance also to improve relations with Hungary. Um, there were two, maybe the most problematic bilateral cases under Poroshenko presidency. That's why I think it's important to mention uh, those two countries. And it means uh, that even modest achievements in the relations will be quite visible. And I think there's a good chance to create a sort of success story here, foreign policy success story. And another positive development is nomination of experienced professional diplomats for key positions in Ukrainian diplomacy. Even in the US now you have Volodymyr Yelchenko and Sergei Kislytia, who are well-known professional Ukrainian diplomats. In the same time, Zelensky's skepticism of diplomacy and diplomats in general remains a serious challenge. As well, um, as his self-imposed deadlines, especially uh, deadline on Donbass negotiations. Uh, to summarize here, I would say that Zelensky mixture of Donbassization and economization as his foreign policy strategy turned out not to be very effective so far. But he still has time to deliver uh, on that or maybe to suggest some amendments to this strategy. Thank you very much for that comprehensive look. Um, Andre, we'd like to turn to you next. You, importantly, at the Paris summit last December, persuaded President Zelensky to toughen Ukraine's position regarding pullbacks along the line of contact. How do you assess the president's success in protecting the country's national security interests? Well, <clears throat> okay, well, first of all, afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me here. And uh, to answer this, there's a long-term answer to this and a short-term. So long-term, obviously, is very complex. Well, short-term is also very complex. But long-term is we basically answering the question, uh, is he doing enough to keep us safe? Uh, well, that's, the, uh, that's, a, that's a question which has no answer, to be honest, because it's a, it's a, it's a very complex security environment we are, we are in. Uh, we're talking about uh, dealing with the military power, which is way much more significant than uh, Ukraine's. And obviously there is always a threat from Russia that, you know, that is kind of, you know, we, we experience and, and we, 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 we see that. However, uh, however, at the same time, uh, on the short term, we see uh, the largest budget for the defense ever in the history. We see uh, open door policy for the uh, all NATO so far, I have to say. Uh, to the NATO integration and the NATO standards. We, we have to see the results of this, but um, at least on Zelensky level, we, we see that. Uh, we clearly see a full support to the armed forces, which they require, whenever they require that. And, uh, and uh, they started to look at the, some strategic capabilities, for example, like Navy, which obviously is a, is a very encouraging sign. Uh, on, the, on the peace process, so-called, uh, we have to say that uh, we haven't seen, I mean, I haven't seen in a team of mine, we haven't seen any significant issues uh, so far uh, and significant uh, mistakes, uh, except obviously uh, that uh, we were very close on 13th of May, of March, sorry, to sign that uh, so-called uh, uh, working group with the, uh, with the, with the, directly with the, uh, uh, with the representatives of the so-called uh, republics. Uh, and uh, that would be, the, but but that did go very far. So so basically speaking, we are uh, we we are we are, we are, we are again changing the changing the modality of this of those negotiations. And uh, based on what we what was done in Normandy, I mean in Paris uh, on a, during the Normandy talks, we we don't see that uh, the, 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 there were any any mistakes or strategic mistakes or anything like this. The great thing which happened, the, the, the very positive part, 
is that the, uh, Zelensky is actually requiring negotiations. He's requiring talks. He's actually putting this agenda on the table, uh, which is a, a, a drastic difference from Poroshenko's uh, plan, because Poroshenko was basically saying, we'll never agree with Russia. We're never going to put up anything like, uh, uh, and the only thing the West has to do is to support us, and we have to apply sanctions, and that's pretty much it. Zelensky is saying he is uh, expecting uh, some resolution. The good thing about this is that he's he's taking a driver's seat and basically he's taking a will and 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 he's he's sort of demanding the demanding the resolution. He's he's putting this agenda always on the table and not letting uh, Russia uh, relax and say, well, actually, nothing's happening. It's kind of frozen conflict now. We are protecting Russian-speaking people in Donbass, so we're not aggressor anymore. And every time when these negotiations are not happening. Uh, it's a, it's absolutely clear because they're not happening or they're not resulting because Russia is basically sabotaging the, uh, the 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 resolution. So they are they actually stepping out of the of the process or either them or the republics so called, and uh, that's what's happening. So we are uh, we're constantly like putting putting these demands on the table. Like we need to resolve this. We need to resolve it. The question is, are we realistically seeing the resolution nearby? Well, that's a question. Obviously, uh, it's, it's the most difficult one because it's uh, it does not depend on Ukraine only. Uh, Ukraine does, and Ukraine shows to the whole world that it does everything possible and everything needed to find the solution. Bringing more people to the negotiation table, they're bringing different people to the negotiation table. They, I mean, the, um, the administrator, the president's office, they're like coming up with all kinds of ideas, and it may look like, you know, there is no plan. But at the same time, everybody understands that there cannot be a plan because we're dealing with an unpredictable um, uh, counterpart from that side. So, uh, demonstrating the willingness to find the solution is a massive, uh, massive. And I know I've seen it works. I've seen. I've been talking to NATO. I've been talking to the uh, representatives of our allies, and everybody is appreciating the fact that it's Ukraine who initiates that. Now. The risk here, there are two re massive risks here. The one risk, number one, is that uh, the pieces are almost like promised uh, by a president. And it's a very difficult thing to promise if you're not, if you're not an aggressor. Uh, so uh, how we can deliver that if, you know, if it's, if it, if, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a risk and it's a risk of uh, public perception of the process and so on. A second risk is that whatever the new solution or interim solution maybe russia is going to try to manipulate it in order to get something out of it uh for itself so for example the uh, uh, an interesting idea a risky but an interesting idea of, of bring people uh who used to live in donbass uh as a some sort of a advisory power uh to the to the to the uh to this process almost ended up like Signing a paper where uh, the representatives, the so-called republic, were called uh, legitimate representatives, which is obviously a, would be a, um, a drastic, uh, dramatic mistake. So uh, what we can say is that there is a risk that every time when we're going to the uncharted borders, uh, Russia is going to try to bring something, you know, which would be uh, either sabotaging the whole process or trying to manipulate it. So uh, from what we see so far, I mean, honestly, it's going to be like that for a while. And uh, Ukraine have always to be a, a one step ahead and bringing up something new all the time. Um, and that's another risk is obviously that uh, this process may just take too long. And uh, this optimism that something, the solution can be fine may take too long. You know, so that's that's what, what I've seen so far. Okay. Andrew, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Bogdan, I'd like to turn to you. And my question has been sort of pre-shadowed by both Andrew and uh, Aljona. Uh, is Zelensky team spark controversy in Ukraine by first embracing the Steinmeier formula for moving forward toward peace in Donbass, and then seeming to accept the representatives of the LNR and the DNR as part of the Trilateral Advisory Commission, a mint subgroup? In each case, however, they were substantially criticized and the team either pulled back or provided a soothing interpretation of its position. What conclusions do you draw from this? Thank you, Ambassador. Well, I draw the conclusion that uh, Zelensky is inexperienced in foreign policy, and his foreign policy has been, in effect, a, an act of improvisation. Um, 
he's had to learn on the job so it's been a learning curve for for him too i would think that today and after the normandy summit in paris and especially after even the ve day celebration he's a lot wiser shrewder careful uh, as as compared with last year i think last year he was very full of himself and he and his team uh, this had positive um, aspects in the sense that they felt that there was a surge of energy and the wind was in their sails, um, you know, that they could also deliver in a turbo regime, not just in Parliament, but perhaps uh, in dealing with Russia. Uh, but obviously they were proved wrong. The other thing is that uh, this also led to a kind of sidelining of the foreign ministry, key people. I mean, for example, uh, Mr. Klimkin, the foreign uh, minister from before, would have been a youth advisor, having gone through five years of with Poroshenko and having at the end, I think, uh, expressed his willingness to be part of a new team, even if not a full-fledged member of it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another positive thing that emerged unforeseen was that somehow, innately within the Ukrainian society, uh, with the foreign ministry and the experts shunted aside, somehow a system of checks and balances emerged so that when uh, Zelensky and his team were testing the limits of what was acceptable in terms of thinking outside of the box, approaching Russia and trying to deliver and not just uh, resume talks, uh, then the so-called red lines were brought into play and uh, he and his team were reminded of the limits for maneuvering and brought back uh, into, into play, as it were, as in the acceptable way that play was, uh, is accepted here in Ukraine. Um, look, I think that, you know, he was interested in trying to... Um, um, the moribund uh, peace process, we couldn't even call it a peace process, the, uh, the talks of it. You know, I used to work for the UN, as you know, and I remember when I was representative for UNHCR in Azerbaijan, we had a Minsk group working on Nagorno-Karabakh. You remember that, some of you. And now we have a Minsk process that's been going five or six years. There's been the semblance of negotiations, but until we had uh, a meeting after a two-year thanks to uh, the flexibility shown by uh, Zelensky. Uh, things looked as if they were frozen forever in that situation. So, of course, he took a risk, Zelensky, by agreeing to the Steinmeier formula. The Steinmeier formula was not his invention and not his suggestion. And you will recall that for two or three weeks, there was resistance in Kiev against accepting it. But it seems that the team, Zelensky and his inner circle, felt that it was uh, worthwhile risking uh, the opprobrium that would occur in order to get Putin to sit down at it and face him and look him in the eye as he wanted it uh, to be. Well, they did meet, and as we know, I think Zelensky came out far better than we expected. Uh, not simply, as Aliona said, because he didn't cave in and capitulate as many of his detractors uh, expected, I think naively, but because his ground, and he actually dared to uh, question Putin in the presence of Macron and Merkel, about uh, some of the provisions of the Minsk agreements, uh, suggesting that some of them needed to be reviewed. Uh, there was tacit support from Merkel. Uh, uh, Macron has, didn't wade in, really. But that, I think, uh, unnerved Putin, certainly from the response later from Lavrov and others uh, back in Moscow. Uh, so I think that was very important to say that what was agreed under pressure in 2014 and 15 is not fixed in stone. Uh, if we want to move ahead, um, then we should uh, be a little bit more flexible and realistic, shall we say, in, in the context of that. Since then, what we've seen is that um, 
he has um, more or less stuck to the position that he said he would, that he no capitulation, no giving away on fundamental issues, etc. I think yet again, like the Steinmeier uh, uh, formula discussion, this notion of somehow finding a way out to in to include a broader representation of uh, the population uh, in the Donbas, particularly these intelligentsia people that have been forced to leave, and to include them in some sort of um, advisory body that wouldn't have any uh, clout, as it were, legal clout, that that might work. Of course, it was misinterpreted. It's been, I think misinterpreted and seen as something very negative and and as uh, conceding. Um, I think had he played it skillfully, it might even have worked in moving things forward a little way. But okay, that's gone now. I think what the worrying thing is that he has delegated, in effect, responsibility to one person, Yermak, let's mention him, who has become mm, effectively the not only the prime negotiator with Moscow, but a foreign minister uh, in all but name. And I think that this, this is unsettling because um, this is not a professional diplomat. This is not somebody who has uh, the experience and knows all the tricks that Lavrov knows, that Putin himself has developed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it could be very easy, perhaps, to trick them, to trap them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he has to watch his way. But a year later, I think that, uh, as Alona has mentioned before, uh, he's, he has not let the side down. He's presented a new image, a new approach, uh, and I hope he has learned lessons along the way. Okay, thank you, Bogdan. Here's the focus, we turn to Steve. Um, an, an unfortunate problem for President Zelensky was the effort to persuade him to investigate former Vice President Biden and his son, and the subsequent central place of Ukraine in US impeachment hearings. How do you think Zelensky acquitted himself during this process? And do you think this issue will come up again during the U.S. presidential elections? Okay. Well, thank you, John, and thank you for including me. Um, good evening to those in Kiev. Good afternoon to those who are in uh, who are in uh, Washington. Um, I think when President Zelensky took office, he found himself immediately facing a very difficult situation with regards to policy with the United States that was not of Ukraine's making. This was entirely about the situation in Washington, and what Ukraine had to contend with was that there were, in effect, two American policy approaches towards Ukraine. One was carried out by Ambassador Yovanovitch and Ambassador Taylor on the ground in Kyiv, and that was a policy based on official American interests. It was designed to promote Ukraine's development as an independent, stable, democratic state. It was designed to bolster Ukraine's ability to stand up to Russian aggression. And then you had the second approach that was organized primarily by the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, that was not coordinated with the US government. It was not based on American national interests. It was based simply on promoting the president's personal political interest. And it was designed to get Ukraine to investigate old discredited conspiracy theories. One about the CrowdStrike company, the other about the connection between Orisma, the Vice President Biden's son, and suggesting that Vice President Biden's effort to get uh, Prosecutor General Shokin fired in 2015 in 2016 somehow was improper. Thoroughly discredited, you know, but Mr. Giuliani was pushing those theories. And, and at the beginning, uh, Mr. Zelensky and his inner circle engaged with Giuliani, which I think was understandable. You know, you're a brand new president in Kyiv, you want to have that connection to the White House, so you're going to deal not only with the embassy, but you also see in Mr. Giuliani a direct link to Mr. Trump. But I think uh, the inner circle at Bangova quickly began to see the risk in that. Uh, and you saw that in the way that President Zelensky handled the press conference with President Trump when they met in New York in September. Uh, and I would argue that he's acquitted himself quite well. On the one hand, he's not contradicted President Trump, and that's understandable. There is no advantage for Ukraine in having President Zelensky come out and say President Trump was wrong. But on the other hand, 
he has launched no investigations. There's no been no investigation into Vice President Biden or any of those charges. And that's important because that would have alienated Democrats in Congress. And one of the strongest assets that Washington has, or that Ukraine has in Washington, perhaps the strongest asset, is bipartisan political support from Democrats and Republicans that goes back all the way to the early 1990s. And that's a real asset for Ukraine. It's promoted support for both economic reform assistance, but also military assistance for Ukraine. And so I think over the past eight or nine months, President Zelensky has done a very good job of walking that narrow path between not alienating the American president, but also not disrupting bipartisan support in Congress. But he's going to need to keep doing that because I think Ukraine in the next six months will get pulled back into American domestic politics as we get closer to our presidential election in November. First of all, in, in Donald Trump, you have somebody who wants to believe that it was Ukraine, not Russia, that interfered in the U.S. presidential election in 2016. Now, in doing so, uh, Mr. Trump ignores the conclusions of the American intelligence community, he ignores the Mueller Commission report, and he ignores the Senate Intelligence Committee's report, which has been led by Republicans. But I don't think that's going to stop Mr. Trump. He will continue to try to believe and make others believe that this was Ukraine in 2016, not Russia. Second, uh, Mr. Giuliani is still out there. He's still trying to come up with some kind of damaging information on Vice President Biden. And he seems to have very few apparent scruples about he, who he turns to as he tries to build this case. And I think there's a third concern, which is if you look at opinion polls now, almost all polls show that President Trump is trailing vice president nationally, but he's also trailing vice president uh, Biden in some key swing states, Florida, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And I do worry a bit that Republicans in the Senate may begin to get desperate and you may see some Senate committee start up some kind of an investigation into Vice President Biden to try to bring this whole conspiracy theory back to the fore of American politics. So what that means for Ukraine is, Ukraine and President Zelensky have to show the same care they've shown over the last eight months, not to get pulled, not to get manipulated in American domestic politics, because getting pulled into those politics is only going to mean risk for Ukraine and the US-Ukraine relationship. Okay, Steve, thank you. Um, that was excellent. Uh, Leona, I'm gonna give you the first question after these set, but please keep your answer to under three minutes. And that be time for the audience answer. Your sense of how Zelensky has handled the American file, precisely the problem that Steve just addressed. Uh, I think, you know, that um, current, current um, Ukraine's approach is a, a wait and see approach actually, and a wait and see strategy. So maybe it's one of the best strategy, actually, in current political um, situation. Um, there is um, an understanding in Kiev that, not, um, that no progress could be achieved uh, in U.S.-Ukraine relations till U.S. elections. Um, and I'll give you just one example. American partners, including Mike Pompeo in person when he visited Kiev uh, back to January this year, promised Ukrainian counterparts to appoint a special representative on Ukraine's negotiations. The position um, which was taken by um, uh, Ambassador Volker. And uh, still our American partners failed to deliver on that. We still don't have a special representative on Ukraine's negotiations. As a result, um, the US um, is almost invisible uh, at, on Donbass track and Normandy track and um, on our negotiations with Russia. And I think that the US could play uh, quite a constructive role now, as for example, Germany played in terms of uh, creation or launching this consultative um, group or advisory group as we call that, in Minsk. Um, and what I would like to say here also is, you know, not only uh, it's important to mention that not only Ukraine became like uh, more toxic in Washington, but also the US became quite toxic in Kiev. 
and um, not as many as before high level officials would like to deal with American dimension now. Uh, yes, they they lack knowledge, they lack experience how to do that, but in the, on the same time, they are quite, you know, they're a little bit afraid even, you know, to, to approach American partners. They don't know how to behave. They don't know what messages should be delivered at, at this point. Uh, in the same time, uh, the U.S. remains number one bilateral partner for Ukraine. Everyone admits that, and according to uh, um, Ukrainian president diplomatic advisor, uh, which is not officially Yermak, but Igor Zhovko, and he said in his interview last week that the U.S. is number one bilateral partner, still bilateral partner for Ukraine. Um, and, uh, you know, I have very mixed feelings about what is going in uh, our relationship um, last week if you follow news uh, in us ukraine relationship from last week uh, there was a good news about nomination of uh, ambassador or general dayton as a new ambassador to ukraine and for us um, you know nomination uh, a retired general and strategic advisor to defense ministry uh, is a sign and the recognition from the U.S. side that Ukraine is perceived as a country at war and uh, needs uh, appropriate advice from the U.S. But on the same time, you know, there were two statements. The first one, um, it was Putin-Trump statements on 75th anniversary of the meeting on Elbe. And that statement, um, to be frank, puzzled, puzzled me because... Uh, uh, there was no mentioning um, of Ukraine there. And it, it was also a very good statement by State Department and uh, Bucharest 9. Uh, but Ukraine was not mentioned there again, you know. And despite the fact that um, in Ukraine, Russia is waging the only war on the European continent now. So there are a lot of mixed feelings and to wait and see approach uh, conducted by Ukrainian government at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew, yep. um, last July, um, President Zelensky ordered the seizure of a Russian ship involved in team. Was that the right move? And did he receive domestic credit for his boldness? It, it was definitely a right move. Uh, it was definitely the right move. Uh, um, I, I, I would probably say that uh, the credit, uh, you know, generally speaking, there was a, it was a uh, un unplanned activity, and uh, obviously uh, people didn't know how to how to react on this, and so I would say credit were, was 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 sort of a mixed. But generally speaking, the whole approach to the ships and the whole approach to the navy uh, to the situation with this uh, uh, navy conflict was uh, was quite correct. And uh, and uh, generally speaking, right now we see um, uh, we see a quite significant attention to the navy situation and to the Black Sea situation. If that attention results in the uh, uh, in a specific steps, which are uh, were, which were planned over the last several months. Um, then, then we can see uh, uh, quite a, a sustainable and quite a planned approach in the uh, for, for, for the overall like conflict, because as we know, it's uh, one of the most uh, uh, overseen and one of the most dangerous areas where we are right now. Um, I, I agree with you. He did not receive due credit uh, in Ukraine, perhaps because it went against type. Uh, people were concerned that he's always going to make too many concessions, and here he did something which directly contradicted that perception. But Bogdan, do you want to jump in here, offer any thoughts? Uh, yeah, just one one thing is that it's not it's not like people always expecting the concessions. It's more like uh, it's more that was um, uh, it, it was it, it was a message not to Ukrainians. It was a message to Russians, and so it wasn't communicated enough to, in Ukraine in order not to create it. As if it looks like a, a, a message to Ukrainians, like look how how strong am I, and that was actually a wise move, 
uh, because it's uh, the Russians have seen it, and uh, and at the same time it was not received as 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 something they need to answer like straight away. Fair point. Well, well I don't necessarily want to add on that. I think that's being covered. I just think that we should mention in parentheses perhaps uh, other vectors of foreign policy. Obviously the Russia. US, Berlin, France. Uh, it's, in, it's interesting that uh, uh, Zelensky has uh, paid quite a lot of attention to cultivating uh, uh, closer ties with Turkey as a strategic partner, but also because of pipelines and other considerations. Obviously, he visited uh, Israel, being of a Jewish background, but he made a very uh, I think behaved himself admirably, sidestepping Putin's uh, um, efforts to entice him into a, an anti-Polish, shall we say, position uh, there during uh, uh, the uh, what was it, the marking of the freeing of Auschwitz? So I can't remember the exact date. Um, so I think uh, it's it's important to see that where I, there are these uh, preeminent themes at the center of his foreign policy preoccupations or those of his advisors, uh, there has been an attempt to, shall we say, consolidate uh, the ground economically, trade-wise, um, energy-wise, uh, with other uh, already existing strategic partners or potential. And I think one of the big issues for him, and we've seen an inkling of this, is, is China, uh, Asia, uh, what should the uh, uh, character of relations be with these countries uh, in, in the coming uh, years, uh, dictated by trade concerns, by energy concerns, strategy, etc. So, um, whereas we're focused today, obviously, on the Russian-Ukrainian Washington dimensions, uh, I would say that we should not neglect also these other aspects there in, in the background. Well, that's a very fair point. Okay. President Zelensky has um, paid a great deal of attention to prison releases. Um, Steve, you have a lot of experience negotiating with, with the Kremlin. Do you think this is a plus or a liability uh, on terms yeah. favorable to Ukraine? Yeah, no, it, it seems to me that the prisoner exchanges, there's really sort of two sides to it. Uh, on the one hand, you have the importance, and I think that President Zelensky has attached to getting Ukrainians released, Ukrainians that are held, uh, you know, by the illegitimate authorities in uh, in occupied Donbas, uh, and I think that's understandable, and I think that's been a big part of his push to really sort of change the game board on Donbas over the past year. Uh, I mean, I think the risky side here is to the extent that the president does appear over eager on that. Uh, it may lead those in the Kremlin who I think are really making the decisions here. I don't think the decisions are made, you know, in occupied Donbass. It's really made in the Kremlin. And do do they then see that this is a way to basically um, pressure the president uh, to drive a harder bargain? And so I think there's this kind of this there's this pull, and there's a bit of tension between, on the one hand, trying to get those people out, but on the other hand. Manage it in a way that does not suggest that you're so interested in getting the people out that that somehow confers on the Kremlin additional leverage. Thank you. I'd like to take some questions from the audience now. And we have one from Ben Chalice of the ELN. He's an ELN policy fellow. He, he asked, Zelensky has indicated he'd walk away from the Normandy format talks if there's no agreement by March of 2021. Does anyone believe that this threat is credible and if so, what is an alternative process, a format to replace it? Uh, briefly, uh, to jump in, if, if, if you want, if you want to kamikaze, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words. I was in Geneva at a protest uh, on the day before the Minsk uh, agreements were made. And you recall that there was a meeting in Geneva in which the US also participated with Russia. And I can't remember who else was present. Was it Poland or so? And there was a possibility, very briefly, of a, a very different type of format. Uh, oh, the EU. 
uh, until uh, it seems the uh, EU delegated, or so we're led to believe, to Germany and to France to take on its responsibility. Uh, I think Poroshenko's line from the very outset was to internationalize as much as possible uh, uh, the, the approach to the conflict, uh, but then, you know, was hemmed in by, by realities into dealing within the confines uh, of the Minsk group and, and the Normandy process. Um, I think that there was an element of bluff last year saying, look, either we meet and we have results or this is a waste of time and we'll look for other options. Clearly, given attitudes and, and preoccupations in Washington, uh, Brexit, um, uh, Merkel on her way out, uh, Macron faced with his own domestic policy, it's, it's not as simple these days to simply say, uh, yes, we can come up, uh, we can pull out uh, some other formula out of uh, the magician's hat. So right now, I think we, we're still stuck with... Uh, the formula that exists, and that's why we've seen this renewed effort in the last few days to try and get Berlin to to persuade the Russians to come on board and to have another meeting and to actually uh, have some kind of agenda that uh, might signal another, you know, centimeter of progress in in, in this uh, difficult uh, business. Okay, I'm yeah, can I, John, John, yeah. can I say to that? Uh, yeah. Because I, I would add, I mean, I can understand, and it is understandable, why in Ukraine there's a certain amount of frustration with Minsk, because both in September of 2014 and in February of 2015, when Ukraine reached agreements in Minsk, it was when there was a very precarious military situation uh, for Ukraine. Um, but my, my caution would be is that before leaving the Minsk process, uh, Kiev needs to have some alternate mechanism in mind. And in particular, I think uh, Kiev needs to bear in mind that Minsk provides the foundations for six years of European Union sanctions against Russia. And however Ukraine decides to move to a new mechanism, you don't want to cause those sanctions to come undone. I, mean, I think those of us who were pushing for sanctions, and Ambassador Herbst and I worked on this, uh, on the American side uh, six years ago. And uh, I think uh, actually I'm surprised, happily surprised, that the European Union has stayed with the sanctions for six years. I think Chancellor Merkel deserves a lot of credit for that. But it's important for Ukraine that in moving to a new mechanism, don't undo the basis that then allows countries in Europe to say, well, Ukraine's going in a different direction. We can now relieve sanctions. Because I do believe those sanctions do put a significant amount of pressure on the Kremlin. Alion, you want to jump in here, I thought? Yes. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Hello? Alion, then Andrew, please. Okay. Alion. Yeah, first of all, I think that it was a huge mistake by Zelensky to set public deadlines. Uh, he made his position quite vulnerable. And uh, if, you know, uh, Putin can say at every point that, you know, you promised to deliver on that commitment or that commitment until the end of the year, not me, please deliver. And uh, so that, that's the first point. The second point is that the only realistic alternative to Normandy and Minsk format could be bilateral talks, uh, Russian Ukrainian talks. In fact, we already have them via call your mark channel and um, uh, the, there are some grounds to think you know that uh, even now some major decisions are taken without proper coordination with our european partners with germany with france and um, i think that one of the reasons uh, why germany was uh, so skeptical about um, Mm, uh, advisory group idea is because it was not properly coordinated with German partners and properly communicated with them. So in fact, yes, officially we have Normandy, we have Minsk talks, but um, in fact, uh, you know, uh, all major decisions now are, cook, uh, are cooking up uh, on bilateral level, Kozak, Yermak level. Uh, already. 
And um, also, what, what is important, I think, that, uh, you know, Zelensky promised to end the war, but um, it turned out that Ukrainians don't want Zelensky simply to end the war. They want him to win the war, or at least not to lose the war. It's not possible until the end of the year, as he declared. That's why I am afraid we should prepare ourselves to another protracted conflict, which is conflict in Donbass. I don't see any quick wins or quick solutions here, unfortunately. And even among uh, Zelensky vote, electorate, among uh, his voters, votes of his own Sluha Narodu political party, according to different opinion poll, the most popular idea is an idea to temporarily freeze the conflict, not to solve it at any price. So, and for me, it's quite su surprising, you know, that Zelensky is so consistent uh, um, in his idea to set deadlines, to, uh, to um, like um, adopt some decisions uh, which could be detrimental for Ukraine's national interests. And uh, uh, because I think that uh, with his popularity and uh, with his credibility among um, many Ukrainians, um, it could be uh, quite um, okay for him to explain that, you know, Ukraine did everything possible. We did our best. And indeed, he, you know, he demonstrated uh, political will. He showed that he is, um, he has political courage to uh, um, consider some unpopular solutions and um, yeah, deliver on that. So he could simply explain people that, you know, we did our best, but uh, there is no political will in Kremlin. And um, we, you know, we, we should, you know, live with that conflict probably to think how to minimize casualties, to decrease the number of casualties and uh, to develop different strategy, you know, not strategy of peace at any price. Thank you. Andre, you want to jump in on this too? We also have a specific yes, question. yeah, uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll answer, I'll answer from, from how I see the answer to this question. Um, so generally, I don't think he meant to walk away without any alternative. I think what he meant uh, is that uh, we will need to come up with a, some different solution. So basically, it wasn't like unconstructively, okay, that's it, it doesn't work. Uh, shut the door, build the wall, or whatever else you know, uh, and and that's it. We're not we're not doing with this anymore. Um, the discussions like this may we may hear sometimes, but I don't think they 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 seriously considered. Uh, I think it's actually a positive message was, and which which means that if we are not seeing this working for any reason until some period of time. We're not going to be banging our head against the wall over and over and over again until everybody's tired, until everybody's saying, well, guys, you're obviously not progressing. You're not changing anything. So it means like you 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 like the process for the process. And so what, what he meant is that, okay, if, we, if, if that doesn't work, then we're going to sit down with everybody and, and say, okay, so what is going to work? What, what we need to change? Shall we bring more com uh, countries to the... Uh, to the to the table shall we change the format Can we, shall we do it more often shall we do it like somehow differently and so on and i guess it wasn't it wasn't that he was suggesting an alternative what he's he mentioned is is he said he's going to try to find the solution until he finds something which works and he's not going to settle that's what i've heard when basically we discussed it uh, back um, some time ago uh is that we're not going to settle and we're not going to calm down if something doesn't work so, and I guess that was sending a proper message. That was sending a message that uh, regardless of the, of the situation that many people find it hopeless and many people legitimately find it hopeless, uh, he's, going to, he's going to try and he's going to show everybody and including his own team that he's doing whatever is possible to, to find the solution and not, by, and not at any price. I haven't heard that ever. Uh, that, that there was ever, yeah, like we have to find the solution by the end of the year, whatever happens. 
he clearly understands that there's massive amount of scenarios which there's no way we can go to these scenarios and um and uh, and uh, the other good thing is that uh, uh, the frozen conflict uh, it was always considered as the as the last scenario and the most uh, scenario which is not favorable and it's not uh, because because this scenario has a lot of uh, faults and it has a lot of like gaps and uh, Russian will use this like straight away they will say okay guys are you happy with how the things are. If you're happy with how the things are, first of all, we're no longer an aggressor. We're just maintainer of the status quo in that region, protector of that side. And then the next question, okay, what's the next territory to choke from Ukraine? You know, uh, so where, where else do we move? We, we frozen Donbass, where else do we move? So in order to, you know, the frozen conflict would be a, would be a massive strategic mistake, I believe. Thank you. Um, Andre, I have a question specifically for you. Sure. Oh, hold on, you want to jump in? Limit yourself to one minute, Bogdan. One minute. Yeah. No, but Bogdan wants two to words. Go. I okay. think back to you. Well, go, go ahead. One minute. Yeah, just two words. I think you know uh, Zelensky also. I think uh, realized uh, how lonely it can be if uh, Berlin and Paris withdraw uh, somewhat from from the process. Look, uh, problems with the U.S that have been mentioned. Macron at one stage making up to, to Putin and, and, and uh, really uh, you know, giving him the benefit of the doubt publicly. Uh, Merkel uh, supportive but on the way out and so uh, and also Nord Stream 2 being developed etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think in Kyiv there was uh, perhaps uh, a disguised moment of panic that uh, Ukraine was going to be left on, on, a, on its own and in a weakened position vis-a-vis -vis Moscow, which could be a factor uh, to have re-energized efforts of sorts in the last few days uh, as everybody is confronted with the coronavirus uh, pandemic, other concerns, and perhaps Russia is temporarily somewhat uh, in a more weakened uh, state. Okay, thank you. Andre, we've got a question for you from Michael Carpenter, the director of the Penn Biden Center. He asks for oh, your, your sense of the status of defense reforms right now. Uh, I am not a non-biased you know, person to comment that, Michael. So obviously, you know, you you know, my, my, my comments would be really uh, you know, you have to you have to ask somebody else. Uh, but um, from my perspective, uh, I believe that we still have uh, a lot of uh, uh, good momentum. Unfortunately, COVID obviously, you know, disrupted some processes. I think we still have a good chances for the EOP. I think we still, uh, we missed today, we, 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 we had like a bad news today, by the way, I don't know if you're aware, but we, the RADA did not accept the uh, uh, military procurement law, didn't pass. Uh, six votes didn't uh, were weren't enough. I mean, so six, we we were six votes short. Uh, there were a number of um, explanations to that, and I, I strongly believe that this is not a this was this could be a, like a planning mistake or something. It it the, the voting started too close to the break and the people didn't return or something like that. I don't know details, but in any case, uh, it's going to be voted next week, I believe. Uh, the thing is that that law has lots of um, opposition. So we are have a little bit of drama there right now uh, of uh, uh, where, where we're going to go with that law. And as you know, uh, a lot of people consider the, including United States as a partner, and the, generally the, our our partners consider the procurement reform to be one of the most crucial for this year. And so yeah, so that law is crucial for that crucial reform. So uh, that that was a little bit of setback today. Uh, generally speaking, uh, unfortunately, I can't say what the new policy of the new ministry because we haven't seen interviews yet. And here I'm going to stop. Uh, I hope we're going to see some uh, explanations of the of the new leadership. Uh, where are they going to go? And then we can comment on that. But uh, generally, it's not too late. But uh, but uh, there are a little bit of setbacks, like uh, like today, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have four minutes left, and several people have asked about the impact of COVID-19 on Ukrainian foreign policy, the negotiations with Moscow on Donbass. You each have one minute to answer that question. Alion, I'll start with you. 
Um, um, actually, one uh, one of the interesting dimension is uh, developing Asia strategy, uh, which is going to be presented quite soon, as far as I understood. And the uh, new foreign minister Dmitry Kuleba is uh, um, is actively promoting this idea. And um, my concern is that um, China is using, using the situation quite um, actively and um, more than 30%, uh, 34% of Ukrainians think that China is helping Ukraine more than any other partners, which is not true. Um, and... Um, so th th that is one of the result of uh, COVID um, situation, uh, obvious result. Uh, another one, yes, um, there are many concerns that uh, Russia will use uh, effectively the situation in order to ease the sanctions, EU sanctions. But um, I predict that it would not be possible and uh, I think that it was very smart move of uh, Ukraine to provide assistance to Italy. And um, I personally and our center advocated for that because uh, we understand the role of Italy. And uh, uh, Italians, uh, including Italian Prime Minister Conte, uh, they were very grateful for that assistance. And I think that um, um, that was a good move to uh, maybe not to change Italian position, but to um, to make it more, um, let's say, more pro-Ukrainian. Let's say in Thank terms you. of sanctions. Well done. Good. You one minute, please. Briefly in bullet point form: A, uh, the hope that coronavirus will significantly together with the fall in oil prices weaken Russia and somehow impact on its approach, uh, seeing the Donbass as, uh, you know, sort of too costly or whatever, a willingness perhaps to, to naively, uh, the, the belief that this might help uh, to uh, get them to, to, to be more um, conciliatory. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, it got Zelensky off the hook, not having to go to the VE parade uh, or make a decision about that uh, and bought time for him. Uh, now he's faced with a, an invitation from Poland, uh, etc., etc. Uh, and thirdly, that uh, a fear of contagion from from the occupied areas themselves, where there is a general perception, uh, as played up in the Ukrainian media, that uh, there aren't the controls, the checks, and that uh, that pandemic could seriously impact also on, on the Western side of, of, of the, the control uh, line. Thank you very much. Steve? Yeah, two comments. I think, first of all, uh, I, I would second what Bogdan said about COVID-19's impact on Russia is that the picture for the Kremlin looks very different now than it looked five months ago, uh, having to do with COVID-19, its economic consequences, and also the fall in oil price. And Vladimir Putin can't fix any of that. You know, mm -hmm. One way to get some early relief, of course, would be to reach a settlement in Donbass that would allow the lifting of Western sanctions. That could give an early boost to his economy. Um, I think there's some prospect that this changes the calculation in Moscow. Although I have to say that we have not yet seen evidence of that. The, the second impact of COVID-19, which I think is maybe a little bit more difficult for Ukraine, is that this is such a huge factor now that's topping everybody's agenda in Washington, in Berlin, in Paris, in Brussels, uh, that it makes it a little bit harder to focus the attention that Ukraine deserves in trying to resolve the conflict that Russia has inflicted on Ukraine. Okay, thank you, Steve. And Andre, the final words to you, please, one minute. Yes, I, I, I fully agree about the weak in Russian position. I was, you know, repeating this in every every time where I can, uh, every, in every place that indeed, I mean, they have a, a much worse situation that they'd like to admit. They will obviously never admit that, but uh, but we know that and we, we, we're quite certain, especially with the oil prices and COVID like combined. Um, the, 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 the problem with this is that uh, it's tough to put this as a, some sort of negotiation uh, 
argument and especially that uh, whatever they will whatever they will try to do they will want the uh, sanctions removed in exchange and whatever they're going to give in exchange for removal of the sanctions they will try to to cheat everybody and we know that and uh, for how long that whole discussion will, will take place no one knows um, and uh, they, they're obviously trying already to remove the sanctions uh, you know calling to the international community and so on and so on I think that from that perspective, you know, there, there's a, it's a good chance to strengthen the negotiation position, but I don't think, Russia, I mean, unless something is terribly bad there, uh, Russia is going to, uh, to do that. Uh, generally, I believe that, uh, uh, that gen I mean, the, the, the whole world is going to the shock and to the crisis and to, through the change of the, of the formats and the, and the, and the frameworks. Um, so if something doesn't work, that's a good time to raise this question and say and suggest some sort of other formats and that's coming back to the question what if normandy doesn't work it's not like walking away from normandy but perhaps suggesting that uh strengthen the format somehow or improve the format somehow because lots of formats of everything is happening in the world is going to be updated these days people going to do things differently and like for example our ambassador in canada andrei shachenko suggested to include canada in normandy just now in the chat uh, if that if if that's going to be acceptable, I think that would be a wonderful idea. And same thing for some other countries as well. So yeah, I mean, crisis always gives some new opportunities. That's it. That's I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning. In time, thank you. What you're looking at Zelensky's foreign policy, domestic policy. So thank you all for a nice session. We look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye. Bye now.